Okay, so the last bit of this lecture kind of segues into the next lecture. We're going to talk a little bit about how pregnancy is identified. Um, we have quite a few pregnancy tests, and we actually have pregnancy tests that are very um, sensitive now. HCG is the earliest marker. Human chorionic gonadotropin is, is a, a hormone that is produced in pregnancy by the placenta. Uh, pregnancy tests based on serum or urine HCG are very accurate and can be very sensitive. Um, HCG can be detected in serum or urine seven to eight days after ovulation if um, fertilization has occurred. It peaks at 60 to 70 days, decreases then until about 16 weeks, and then it plateaus. And HCG is actually detectable throughout pregnancy and in the early part of postpartum. A higher than expected level of HCG for that point in gestation can be associated with multifetal gestation, with uh, being further along than they really thought they were with a fetus with Down syndrome or gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, a lower level than we expect at that time in gestation can be associated with an impending miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, or just with not being quite as far along as they thought. Um, we also, so pregnancy tests can be bought over the counter. Dollar Tree actually has some that are very sensitive. Um, a, a lot of people who are trying to conceive stock up on Dollar Tree test and they uh, pick it up just about as early as almost any, any urine test that we have. The serum test is used for um, quantitative, but a, a urine test can detect HCG. There are very few conditions that will cause a false positive. A false positive urine HCG or serum HCG is going to be caused by something that is causing HCG, HCG, HCG secretion. So there are some unusual types of tumors that might do that. And then there actually are, uh, are some meds that either, either are HCG or, or trigger HCG. So again, those are not common. So a positive pregnancy test, that person can be pretty confident that they are pregnant. Negative pregnancy tests may happen if the urine is too dilute or if it's just a little bit too early to detect. Um, before the advent of really accurate, widely available pregnancy tests, we looked at presumptive signs, probable signs, and positive signs, okay? So presumptive signs, these are things that the patient themselves might notice and to make them think, I think I'm pregnant. Top of the list is amenorrhea, so missing a menstrual, cycle, menstrual period. Nausea, fatigue, breast changes. Breasts usually become somewhat swollen and tender in the early first trimester. And then perceived fetal movement. So all of those are presumptive, but none of them are a definitive diagnosis of pregnancy. Every one of those signs can be caused by something else. Okay, Probable, these are things that the provider might observe that probably indicate pregnancy, but they're still, they could still be caused by something else. Hagar's and Chadwick signs, the cervix actually becomes enlarged, soft, and bluish because of extra blood flow, and that can be seen on a speculum exam. So that usually is going to be an indicator of pregnancy. Belotment, when um, on a manual exam, when the cervix is tapped, a second trimester fetus will bounce up and then bounce back down and tap the cervix, and that can be felt by the examiner. It's called belotment. Um, there are potentially some other things that could cause the same sensation. So that's not a positive sign of pregnancy. It is probable. And a positive pregnancy test, HCG, either serum or urine. Again, there are some rare things that could cause a positive. So that is a probable sign of pregnancy, not positive. There are three positive signs of pregnancy. That means there's no other possible reason this person could have this sign. One is fetal heart tones. When you listen to fetal heart tones and you hear a heart rate that is clearly different from the maternal heart tones, then you know there's a fetus there. Another is the fetus can be visualized on ultrasound. They can see the fetus. The third is fetal movement palpated by a provider. Okay, so the provider feels fetal movement, then that's considered a positive sign. All the others are either presumptive or probable. How do we know 
when, how's the due date established? How do we know when um, to expect delivery? Gestational age, first of all, is calculated from last menstrual period. But wait, ovulation doesn't occur then. But until we had ways of pinpointing ovulation, uh, the best uh, marker that we had was the day of the last menstrual period. So gestational age is weeks from day one of the most recent menstrual cycle. So that's caused some confusion recently because with assistive reproductive technology, they can tell you the exact day that embryo was implanted. They can tell you the exact day of fertilization. And that's going to be about two weeks later of the last day of the LMP. So when you're looking at gestational age, you have to make sure that you're looking at how it is calculated. Is it calculated from LMP or is it calculated from a known date of fertilization or implantation? So how do we figure this out? Um, Nagel's rule is just one that we can remember. It's fairly simple. Um, we take, start with the last menstrual period, you subtract three months, add seven days and one year, obviously. So if the last menstrual period was December 1st, then November, October, September, uh, add seven days, September 8th of the following year is going to be that um, expected date of delivery. Um, that's going to be abbreviated EDC or EDD. EDC is a really old term for uh, called expected date of confinement. EDD is expected date of delivery. We also have these really nifty tools called gestational wheels. They used to be handed out by the birth control pill companies. There were two cardboard wheels with stuck together with a little brad, and they're marked so that you can turn the mark the mark around and point to. There's a calendar extra on the outside wheel and the inside wheel has markings. You can point to uh, the first day of the last menstrual period and then it's going to tell you at what point that pregnancy would be 40 weeks. You can also um, put the due date on a date and then you can use that to determine if this patient is here in labor, how many weeks, uh, what's their gestational age. So if you get a chance to look at one of those, look at them. I've got some in the lab here. I think Mr. Rant probably has some. I feel like there's probably some at Wilberton, but they're just kind of a nifty little cardboard dial way of calculating it. Now, most of the time we actually go online and use a gestational calculator. There are easy to read gestational online calculators. Most EHRs that are functional in a labor and delivery setting are going to have a built-in gestational age calculator of some type. Um, so that's using last menstrual period to, um, um, to estimate due date. We also now typically use ultrasound to estimate that due date. So ultrasounds, most women in developed countries get at least one ultrasound in early pregnancy. Sometimes we get quite a few. Those first trimester ultrasounds can uh, frequently give us a fairly... A clear idea of at what point they are in gestation because remember the systems are developing so they can identify what's developed at this point to determine gestational age. After the first trimester they're a little bit less accurate for gestational age because once all the systems are in place as we move later in pregnancy they're looking primarily at the size and um, there's some things they look like how how far the bones have extended and things like that, but they're looking more at size as we advance in gestational age. So they're a little less accurate. Those early ultrasounds can be fairly accurate for determining gestational age. Um, I wanna show you one more thing. We're going to talk about GT-PAL because it's gonna come up when we talk about pregnancy care. And this is just gonna give you a little bit of a head start on that. So GT-PAL is a way of, uh, describing in five numbers um, obstetrical history, okay? We also talk about just G's and P's, but when we talk about gestational history, um, we want to, sometimes we need a shorthand way to have an idea of, of, um, of risk. We always are going to want to get more information when we're doing a more in-depth history, but this is just a really quick way to find out 
how many times that person has been pregnant, how many times are what has happened with those pregnancies. Okay, so G is for how many times they've been pregnant. That's gravita. Okay, G is gravita, how many times they've been, they've been pregnant. T is how many term babies they've had. So how many pregnancies have they carried to full term and delivered? P is how many pregnancies have delivered before 37 weeks. 37 to 42 weeks is considered term. So the T is gonna be after 37 weeks. The P is before 37 weeks, uh, but after 20. A stands for abortion, and that can be either spontaneous abortion, which is a miscarriage, or induced abortion. So A is for um, pregnancies that ended before 20 weeks. L is how many living children they have at this time. So that's GT PAL. Sometimes we also just talk about G's and P's, which is gravita, how many pregnancies they've had, para, how many times have they given birth. All right, that is the end of this complex lecture. Um, I want you to spend some time with this material because as we move forward into care and the potential complications, um, you're going to need to understand what's going on.